Hi, I'm Jan Bitkowski. I'm director of the Banbury Centre here at Cold Spring Harbour. And we're now on the final day of the 79th Cold Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology, which this year has been on cognition and a uh, very fascinating meeting it's been. Uh, I have Cory Bargman from uh, Rockefeller here with me. And we were just commenting about symposia time, how, how long ago the first night seemed to be. Uh, Corrie, you spoke on the, the first morning. Yes, I did. Tell, me a little, tell us a little bit about what, what you talked about and the system that you're interested in. So the, the meeting here has ranged in, from cognition to humans to cognitions of the very simplest animal. And um, my work is in the very simplest animal that's being discussed here at this meeting. It's the ne nematode worm Cenorhabditis elegans. It's a tiny round worm that has only 302 neurons. But despite that very small nervous system, it's a real animal, it moves around, it decides what it likes and what it doesn't like, it learns about its past experience and uses that to affect its future decisions. And we can understand those kinds of basic processes using this very simple nervous system to really relate what's going on in the animal's brain while it's behaving to the whole behavior of the individual. And so what, what aspect of its behavior do you, do you study, do you analyze? So most of my lab studies the response to odors, and that's because odors are the things that worms are most interested in in the world. And in fact, um, they are so well specialized for detecting odors that 10% of their genome encodes G-protein coupled olfactory receptors. Mm. So to give you an idea, humans are thought to be able to smell a trillion different odors, and we do that with about three or 400 different olfactory receptor proteins. Worms have 2,000 olfactory receptor proteins, so we don't even know how many things they can sense. But in any case, this, this matters to the worm, right. and because it matters to the worm, what it smells and what it likes, we, we study those things to try to gain access to their brains. And the question we're trying to understand right now is we have a first order understanding of the olfactory system. We know what the molecules are that detect odors. We know what neurons those molecules are in. We know which odors the animal finds attractive and why it finds them attractive. And we're now starting to ask the second order questions, which is that even in simple animals, they don't act the same every time. That when given a particular set of circumstances or a particular set of choices, sometimes they'll pick one and sometimes they'll pick the other one. And so, this is true even if you have animals under identical circumstances, even if they're getting the identical odor, even if you have many animals of identical genotypes, you still see this variability. So, so the question is, where does the brain generate variability? So they're not like some little robots that, that act automatically in, in a preset ways to particular, well not even preset, but it will always respond in the same way to a given stimulus. They're not little robots. No, that sort of and, and I think that that's anyone out here at Cold Spring Harbor looking at the, the animals here, the birds or even the insects, will not think of them as little robots. Mm. One of the most striking features of behavior in any animal is that it's variable, is that different animals are doing different things. Right. Some of the time they're wandering around, some of the time they seem to be engaged in purposeful action. They're tuning in and out of different behavioral programs. And so, what, what's the, the worm's response to? To odor, I mean, it presumably, if it's the, if it's an attractive odor, it, it tends to follow follow the gradient. Yes, that's exactly right. The odors that we're studying are attractive odors, and one of the responses we look at is whether the animal tries to move toward the odor. So, if you take the odor away, for example, it will change its direction. It will look for the odor that it's missing, but not always. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you take the odor away, and it doesn't seem to respond at all. It just keeps going on as though it didn't notice. And so the first question we asked actually is, well, did it notice? Did, did its brain even know that the odor was taken away? And since the worm is transparent, we can use fluorescent markers of neural activity in a live animal without perturbing it at all to look at the activity of different neurons within mm -hmm. the animal's brain. And the, and the answer to the first question is, the worm knows perfectly well that the odor used to be there and now it's not there anymore because we can see the olfactory neurons generating very strong signals when the odor appears or is removed. And we see the olfactory neurons responding whether or not the animal generates a behavioral response. Mm -hmm. 
So the variability is not because of the ability to detect. The variability is really a choice inside the worm's brain about whether to respond to what has just been detected. But it's only got 302 neurons, so it doesn't seem much of a brain to make a make decisions. So what what is the what is the decision process that that gives rise to this variable response? And and that so that's the beauty of the worm is that if you can't explain where the variability came from, you don't have anyone else to blame. You only have 302 neurons. You have to be able to use the properties of those neurons to explain the variability mm -hmm. of the behavior. And so we've been working in, on the one hand, from the olfactory neurons to look at their activity and the activity of their targets. And on the other hand, we've been working back from the motor neurons that generate the changes in direction, the changes in behavior, and asking, these two can be far apart where do we start to see those two signals separating from each mm -hmm. other? And what our results suggest is that whether the animal responds or not depends on what is going on in its brain, in its own endogenous brain activity when the signal arrives. So that there are internal patterns of brain activity that the animal moves through spontaneously, mm -hmm. just as part of its locomotor pattern. If signals arrive at certain times, then they're detected. If signals arrive at other times, they're ignored. And we all know that sometimes when your mother's shouting at you, you listen to her, and sometimes you yes, don't. Yeah. And um, essentially, that is what the, the nervous system of the worm is doing. Is it's a, at, at certain times, it's, it's available or accessible to external stimuli, mm -hmm. and at certain times, it's driven by internal stimuli, and will, for just a few seconds, not incorporate external stimuli into its decision making. So, can you explore what those in, internal internal signals, whatever whatever you want to call them, are that interrupt this sort of one-to-one -one relationship between receiving, sensing something, and, and doing something about it? What what what's this internal state of the brain that disrupts that flow? There are different kinds of internal states of the brain that my lab is interested in. Actually, several different forms of internal states. So one kind of internal state within the brain is the kind of internal state that's generated by neuromodulators, which is to say by, which we think of as, as the molecules that represent certain kinds of motivational and emotional states. So that, for example, an animal that's hungry responds very differently to a stimulus mm -hmm. than an animal that's well fed. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of, those kinds of differences are, are to a large degree represented in the neurochemistry of different kinds of neuromodulators operating on certain synapses to make them more or less sensitive. But in the case of this very specific decision, the, the level at which we're looking is really from minute to minute, that the animal will respond on minute one, respond on minute two, not respond on minute three, respond again on minute four. And we think that those are actually much faster forms of internal activity that are really neural activity in its ongoing fashion. So one of the things that people have seen for many years in more complex brains, and that people are now seeing in worm brains as well, is that in fact, the different neurons of the worm brain or of any brain often have collective patterns of activity mm -hmm. rather than completely independent mm -hmm. patterns of mm -hmm. activity. And one of the terms that's used to describe that, based on work from John Hopfield and David Tank in the 1980s, is a, an attractor state. The groups of neurons tend to become coactive and then maintain each other's activity. And then a competing group of neurons will sort of seize control of the nervous system and become mm -hmm. active and mm -hmm. maintain its activity. Mm -hmm. And these sorts of activity patterns are what we think represent the activity states that allow animals to be responsive or non-responsive. That temporary patterns of activity representing groups of neurons with collective activities are sensitive or insensitive right. to other kinds of input. Hmm. Um, there are our work points in that direction. We see that for smallish number of neurons. Work from some other groups, um, Ali Pasha Vaziri and Manuel Zimmer's lab has allowed them to look at the activity of the entire worm brain simultaneously. And they have really remarkably strong evidence for large groups of neurons that become coactive and then become inactive mm -hmm. and might remain active or in an active state for tens of seconds before flipping down into an inactive state. So I can see it's an advantage uh, if, if a worm is hungry that it, it that, that sort of general state would make it respond more consistently 
to move in the direction of an ode. It would override this sort of almost stochastic thing. So what's the advantage to the worm or human beings? Because didn't Francis talk about binding in these ways? What, what's the advantage to the worm of, ha of having these different states, these different attractive groups of, of neurons coming up? And, well, you know, the, I suppose the, the, the functional significance. Is what's the problem. functional significance of these states? I think that's a question that we need to explore the answer to rather than to assume the answer to. Mm -hmm. But I would say that one way of thinking about that that is influencing us is that the idea that at any given time, you want to select one action and suppress other actions. Mm -hmm. Then in any given circumstance, the worst thing you can do is essentially seize up and do, try to do three things at once. And so the nervous system perhaps commits to particular kinds of actions, suppresses alternative actions, and then over some period of time will allow new actions to take place. Mm -hmm. And I think this concept of action selection can be useful in a variety of different circumstances. Yeah. 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 So, I, like, I, like, yeah. I like the idea of poor little worm, sort of its brain seizing up and it sort of just, well, I think it wouldn't necessarily freeze, but being committed to something. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so changing the subject, or going from the sublime to the ridiculous, from 302 neurons to however many billions or trillions we have, um, there is this NIH project, uh, Brain Initiative project, that's been proposed. You, you've been involved in, in devising this, this project, or setting up, guiding this project? Um, so a year ago, President Obama announced that there was going to be a grand challenge in neuroscience to understand the brain, analogous to the space program or the war on cancer or mm -hmm. other or the human genome that, project. That, the war on cancer may not be a particularly good example. Well, I would say that the war on cancer has been a long war, and we have not given up. Yes. We have okay. neither. We have neither won. We've won battles. <laughs> yes. yes. And it's and we're still in Sorry. it. <laughs> so let's go back to the brain. Back, but yeah. let's go back to the brain. So when that was announced <laughs> about a year ago, the National Institutes of Health and, and Director Francis Collins decided that rather than simply jump in, he wanted to have a, a rigorous scientific planning process. And so he asked a group of fifteen external scientists in different areas <laughs> of neuroscience, but also engineering, clinical science, um, chemistry, physics genetics to get together and to ask what are the important problems that we need to study in the brain, what are the best approaches to take to solving them, mm -hmm. how would you do that, how much would it cost, and I'm co-chair of that planning committee together with Bill Newsom from Stanford University, mm -hmm. and we have spent the past year um, consulting with ourselves and consulting with many, many other neuroscientists and scientists in general to try to answer those questions. So the first year, the NIH committed $40 million to starting this new project. This is nothing to sneeze at. Mm -hmm. The second year, the NIH has already said that they will spend $100 million on this project. So they liked the plan that we came up with in year one enough to double their right. investment. Right. And we are just about to turn in a final report after a year of planning, and we'll see if the NIH continues to show enthusiasm. But I think there's been quite a broad support for the idea that we're at a time in neuroscience where we can study brains at a level that we've never been able to mm -hmm. study them before. Right. That for 50 years we've been able to look at individual neurons and their activity, and for 30 years we've been able to look at whole brains by fMRI, by imaging and sort of seeing voxels, but that now it may really be possible to look at the networks of neurons and the communicating circuits of neurons that actually transmit information at high speed right. so that we can look at the brain both at high resolution and take look at the big picture of many neurons at once. And there's a sense that this kind of circuit activity is going to be very important for normal brain function, but that also if we understand more about it, that it may provide sort of a, a new way to think about what to do for neurological, psychiatric, yeah. and brain injury disorders. And so there seems to be broad support for the idea that this is the time to tackle this problem. And so is it, is it um, I was going to say, a, a technical project in the sense of, you know, looking at neurons, looking at their physical connections, 
a local level on a brain-wide level. Um, r really analogous to the way the, the Human Genome Project was very much a technical setting a foundation for for future developments in, in human genetics. Yeah, so I think what what sort of inspires the idea of the Brain Initiative now is that there have been some truly remarkable technical advances mm. over the past five to ten years. So the first has been the ability to record from many neurons at once, hundreds of neurons at once instead of just one. The second has been the development of optogenetics, methods for actually perturbing neural activity and not just watching the activity, but actually linking it to causes. And then the third has been a lot really remarkable advances in computing technology that let you take very large data sets and mm. make sense of it, and, and also theoretical and modeling capability. But all of those things are still pretty far from what they would need to be to really address how a circuit worked. So when you're talking about the circuits that are involved in memory formation or perception, it's not a hundred neurons you might be thinking yes, about, it might be a million neurons, quite, right? Quite, quite. And so the first stages of thinking about the brain initiative are making these methods more powerful, more scalable, less expensive, disseminating them broadly, making them available to a large number of people, sort of developing the technology that would mm. make these large scale views of brain activity um, much, much more powerful. And I think the emphasis is that for the first few years that will be the main investment, mm -hmm. and then over time it will shift to using those tools to asking questions, with some of both at both times, but, but a, an intellectual shift. And you said over time, what's the initial thought that the, the project would, would, would last? I mean, what we were initially told as a working group to think about the first year, but then after we handed in that report, we were told to keep thinking. <laughs> and um, I think that there is a general sense in scientific planning that to really accomplish something in science takes more than one or two years. Mm -hmm. That real scientific progress is something that tends to take about you know, at least five years to get going because you need to set things up, you need to be able to take wrong turns and then correct mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And there's also a sense that if you're thinking out more than about 10 years, you're just gonna be yeah. hopelessly yeah. out of date yeah. by the time yes, by the time it's done. And so I think in real terms, people have tended to try to think 10 years ahead, where you think in a lot of detail about what's gonna happen in the next couple of years, you think in moderate detail about mm -hmm. what might be possible mm -hmm. in five years, and then you just give a very rough sense of what hopeful. might be <laughs> yes. what might be possible yeah. at the end of that. Well, I hope uh, I hope we can have the same conversation in ten years' time and see and see where things are then. I hope so. It's always wonderful to be at Cold Spring Harbor. I was at the brain meeting here in nineteen ninety mm -hmm. and it was the first time I was really exposed to systems neuroscience and right. it was a great experience. Uh, I still yes. feel that there was a lot I learned there. I hope that there are students and postdocs here having the same Thank experience Thank you very now. much, Corey.